Looking to burn a week or two and want to check out an entire ski region? Enter the Rocky Mountain states of Utah and Colorado. Colorado and Utah are two of the most popular destinations for skiing in the world, boasting multiple top-of-the-line resorts with a wide variety of experiences. But even with so much variety, there's still bound to be a couple of notable distinctions between the two regions. So is either state specifically better in certain respects? And does one make more sense for certain groups than others? In this video, we'll break down what you can generally expect from the ski resorts in each of these states, the pros and cons of the regions, and why you might want to choose one over the other. If you find this information helpful, be sure to like this video and hit subscribe so you don't miss any of our content. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where you can follow along as we travel around the peaks and share our first impressions before they ever make it up in our videos. And finally, several of you have been wondering what equipment we use to produce our content. Well, you don't have to wonder anymore. We've compiled an Amazon list laying out our full suite of camera and audio gear. You can check out our affiliate page and support the channel by clicking the link in the description below. When it comes to booking a trip to one of these states, the first thing you'll probably want to think about is the quality of the mountains themselves. And one of the most notable distinctions between the two regions is in the snow quality of the resorts. Utah's destinations can essentially be broken into two sub-regions, the Cottonwoods and not the Cottonwoods. The Cottonwoods ski resorts have much higher snow totals and better snow quality than the other Utah destinations, seeing accumulation so good that one could argue it's the best in all of North America. On the other hand, Colorado resorts have much more similar snow quality to one another, all of the destinations in Colorado have very good snow with relatively frequent powder days. It's not as consistent as Utah's best mountains, but typical guests won't be disappointed with the experience. Outside the Cottonwoods, Utah's resorts receive very similar snow totals to the Colorado mountains. Accumulation is slightly drier, but snow retention is arguably a bit worse due to lower elevation terrain. When it comes to resort reliability, both regions are very strong choices. If you're booking a trip between February and mid-March, you can expect the full mountain to be open at pretty much every destination in both states. Mid-January is even a good bet for all but the most extreme terrain offerings. But when it comes to a December or early January trip, Utah is probably the better bet if you want to ski the full mountain. Resorts in both states always open at least some terrain by the December holidays thanks to early season snowmaking, but some of Utah's Cottonwoods Mountains tend to be nearly 100% open by this time thanks to strong natural snowfall. Such quick openings are rare at most Colorado Mountains and at the non-Cottonwoods Utah resorts. On the other hand, some of the lower elevation Utah resorts are a bit quicker to see their conditions deteriorate in late March, while all Colorado Mountains and the higher elevation Utah ones generally stay very reliable through the end of the month and even April. If you have beginners in your group, Colorado might look like the better destination on paper. Its mountains are generally a bit mellower than the Utah resorts, with at least acceptable percentages of beginner terrain at nearly every major destination. On the other hand, a not insignificant number of Utah mountains, including Snow Basin, Solitude, and Snowbird, have limited or almost non-existent beginner footprints. That being said, first-timers, or really anyone who hasn't been on a trip to the Rockies before, may want to start with Utah simply due to the elevation circumstances. Colorado's resorts are generally at higher elevations than Utah's, meaning that guests will find thinner air and struggle more to exhibit energy. If you can handle the elevation, Colorado may be the slightly stronger choice if you have intermediates in your group. Both states have plenty of terrain that's suited for this ability level, but Utah visitors will want to heed caution at certain resorts, such as Snowbird and Solitude, where blue runs are notably harder than usual. Colorado blues are definitely a bit more difficult than those at regional mountains outside the Rockies, but at most of them, the uptick in difficulty is minor, and most trails are consistently grouped. For single black level advanced terrain, Colorado and Utah are pretty comparable. There are tough, demanding mogul runs at every destination resort in both states, as well as steep trees and bowls at most mountains. Colorado's mountains generally have more very long black trails, affording slightly better setups for those looking to do endurance laps. 
Colorado's mountains generally also offer more black level groomed runs, allowing for some seriously fast, bombable terrain. But when it comes to true expert terrain, we'd actually give the slight upper hand to Utah. Utah's narrow, jagged peaks make for truly extreme lines across its toughest resorts, even right off the lifts at some mountains. On the other hand, Colorado's I-70 corridor mountains do have some really tough trails, but they aren't as technical, rarely requiring the mandatory straight lining or cliff drops that are common at some Utah mountains. That said, several Utah resorts, such as Park City and Deer Valley, are fairly mellow as well. In addition, Colorado's more remote southern destinations, such as Crested Butte and Telluride, as well as a couple of resorts in the I-70 corridor, including Arapaho Basin, are much more comparable and challenged to the hardest Utah resorts. In general, Colorado mountains have longer vertical drops and larger boundary-to-boundary -boundary footprints than the Utah resorts, with the exception of the absolutely massive Park City and Powder Mountain, none of Utah's mountains are larger than 2,500 skiable acres. On the other hand, six Colorado destinations have skiable footprints well above that number, and eight have total boundary-to-boundary -boundary footprints that crest that metric. But wait a minute, what's the difference between a resort's skiable footprint and boundary-to-boundary -boundary footprint? Well. The overwhelming majority of Colorado resorts do not count the thick bottom tree sections of their mountains as part of their skiable footprint, meaning that from end to end, the resorts are physically larger than their acreage numbers would have you believe. On the other hand, the skiable acreage measurements for all of Utah's resorts includes their full boundary to boundary footprint. For example, while Colorado's Copper and Utah Snowbird might both offer 2,500 skiable acres, Copper actually has a boundary-to-boundary -boundary footprint of 3,500 acres, making its total footprint 1,000 acres larger than Snowbird's. This means that Utah's skiable acreage measurements are generally more quote-unquote compact than Colorado's, since a lot of vacation goers will undoubtedly notice a general feeling of breadth more than a true technical skiable acreage number. Colorado arguably comes out on top when it comes to hosting mega resorts. However, the Colorado resorts are generally further away from one another than the Utah ones. Many Colorado destinations are several hours apart from one another, while it rarely takes more than an hour and a half to travel between any two Utah destinations, if that. Six of the eight major Utah resorts are less than 10 minutes away from their closest neighbor. In fact, Four out of the eight are directly interconnected by trail with one other ski mountain. So even though the Utah resorts are generally smaller, it's not that hard to access more terrain if you really want to. Some Colorado I-70 corridor resorts, including Arapaho Basin, Loveland, and Keystone, and to a lesser extent Vail and Beaver Creek, are also quite close to one another, but the other mountains in the state take at least half an hour to drive between. In general, Colorado's terrain has a much clearer divide between below treeline, tree-defined trails and glades, and above treeline, high alpine bowls, although there are some exceptions. Utah's terrain is more mixed, with thin, skiable woods across all elevations and less of a clear treeline than the Colorado resorts. Bowl areas tend to be smaller at Utah resorts, but some mountains, such as Alta and Snow Basin, have bowls in lower elevation areas at the same elevation as some of their tree-defined slopes. This also results in a world where a lot of Colorado's most unique terrain is concentrated in high alpine areas, whereas the standout terrain at Utah's resorts spans multiple elevations. But before you can enjoy the terrain in one of these states, you'll need to figure out how to get there. And when it comes to resort access, Utah is the clear winner. The major Utah mountains are about as close as destination resorts can get to a major international airport, with all of them less than an hour and a half from the Salt Lake City airport with no traffic, and most of them less than an hour away. This essentially means that Utah visitors can practically plan a stop at every resort in the region. With Salt Lake City smack in the middle of the routes between these mountains, it's a perfect lodging hub, and vacation goers can enjoy all the city has to offer after a day on the slopes. On the other hand, the Colorado resorts are much further away from their closest major city, which, in most cases, is Denver. The vast majority of Colorado mountains are located along the Interstate 70 corridor a few hours west of Denver. Despite this being an interstate highway, it is a long, dangerous drive. The route involves steep gradients, twisty roads, and multiple mountain passes that can close during inclement weather. 
Utah's resorts involve significantly less travel time up difficult mountain roads, with many of the routes involving flat, city-like driving until only the final 10 or so miles. That said, the mountain sections of many of these Utah drives aren't exactly easy either, and the access roads can close under inclement weather conditions as well. A handful of destination Colorado resorts are located several hours away from Denver outside the I-70 corridor, including Aspen Snowmass, Telluride, Steamboat, and Crested Butte. These mountains are all incredibly remote and too far away from other resorts to be practical for most multi-destination trips, although Aspen Snowmass does have four distinct, separate mountains that for all intents and purposes make it a multi-destination vacation on its own. On the other hand, there are no major Utah ski resorts outside the Salt Lake City area, although a few smaller ski mountains do exist around other parts of the state. All of the remote Colorado resorts and some of the western I-70 corridor mountains can be accessed from much closer, more regional airports than Denver. However, flights to these destinations tend to either be difficult to book logistically or extremely expensive. When it comes to Utah, it probably makes the most sense to fly into Salt Lake City for all destination mountains. Utah obviously has Salt Lake City, but if you're staying up in the Alpine, Colorado has a much better variety of mountain towns. Nearly every Colorado destination has an associated town with it, with the majority of rocky ski towns you've heard of, including Aspen, Vail, Breckenridge, Steamboat, and Telluride, all located in the state. All of these towns have plenty going on off of the slopes, and are great choices for those who don't want to spend their entire day on the ski mountain. There are plenty of opera activities in each town, with numerous bars and restaurants that are perfect for unwinding after a busy day on the mountain. At most Utah resorts, it's a stretch to say that there's even a town in the first place. The one notable exception is Park City, which is actually a really fun spot. But the two ski resorts in town, Park City and Deer Valley, aren't really that great compared to much of the state's competition. In Utah, you can get either a really good ski town or a really good mountain, but in Colorado, you can get both. If you're looking to beat the crowds, neither Colorado nor Utah are exactly great bets for a weekend or holiday trip, but a handful of destination mountains in both regions do offer notable reprieve. Utah's Powder Mountain is exceptional at keeping crowds at bay, and Colorado's Beaver Creek and Telluride are very strong in this respect as well. That said, these mountains are either very remote, very expensive, or tough to secure tickets for, making them tough to visit for many. Typical mountains in both states now have at least modest weights on lifts during busy times, and at several resorts, especially those on the Epic and Icon Pass products, the weights have gotten worse in recent years. Speaking of multi-day pass products, choosing between these states might come down to which one you have. If you have an Epic Pass, Colorado is the clear winner. This product is owned by Vail Resorts, and as one might expect, the company has a very strong regional presence. Six Colorado resorts are on the full Epic Pass, while five are on the base Epic Local Pass. Four of these resorts are right on the I-70 corridor. The only Epic resort in Utah is Park City. If you have an Icon Pass, the picture is a bit more muddy. Both Colorado and Utah have numerous Icon Pass destinations, with six each in both states, and the Colorado mountain total increasing to nine if you count the four Aspen mountains as separate destinations. That being said, the Icon Base Pass is worse in Utah. Alta, Deer Valley, and Snow Basin are all absent from the cheapest pass product, cutting the state's resort offerings down by half. If you're a skier, consider splurging for the Icon Base Plus Pass or a full Icon Pass if you plan on a Utah trip. Only Aspen Snowmass is absent from the Icon Base Pass in Colorado, and three of the six Colorado Icon Base resorts don't even have holiday blackouts. Every Utah resort is blacked out on the Icon Base products during holiday periods. In addition, the Icon Pass, and even maybe just a multi-resort trip in general, is arguably worse in Utah if you're a snowboarder. Both Alta and Deer Valley completely prohibit the activity on their slopes, and they're the only two rocky ski mountains on the continent to do so. But what about when it comes to the total cost of booking a ski trip to either state? Well, it's going to vary quite a bit depending on how nice of a hotel or lodge you decide to stay at, but when it comes to economical options, Utah is the clear winner. If you stay in Salt Lake City, 
you can save quite a bit on lodging, whereas cheaper accommodations that are reasonably close to the mountains in Colorado are really hard to come by. However, lodging prices are much more comparable when it comes to upscale and luxury accommodations in the mountains, and the nicest hotels in both states are prohibitively expensive for most guests. At some mountains in both states, such as Alta in Utah and Aspen Snowmass in Colorado, even the cheapest accommodations are probably out of budget for the vast majority of individuals. For those who don't have one of the multi-resort passes, tickets at the mountains in both states are about as expensive as they get. However, tickets in Utah are generally more reasonable than those at Colorado resorts. A handful of Colorado mountains do have somewhat affordable lift tickets, but none of the resorts that fall into this bucket have on-site lodging, which reduces their practicality for guests who don't have access to a car. So when it comes to choosing between Colorado and Utah for your next ski trip, which one is better? Well, it really comes down to a matter of preference. Utah's very best resorts arguably beat out Colorado's due to top tier snow and terrain quality, but Colorado has a much larger quantity of strong destinations with offerings on both major pass products. Utah's mountains are much better for ease of access, but Colorado's mountains sit above world-class towns with much more going on after the slopes close. But ultimately, both regions are world-class ski destinations and most guests won't be disappointed with a trip to either state. For more information on Colorado, Utah, and over 70 North American ski resort destinations, check out peakrankings.com. See you for the next one.